Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the last week of journalism on the Vatican and global Catholic Church beat. Here's what we've got for you. We are going to begin this week with keeping on, keeping on. Despite various health challenges, Pope Francis continues to show a remarkable degree of resilience. We'll unpack the latest in terms of the papal health front and what to look for going forward. Then secondly, we've got conning the conclave. Persistent rumors are that Pope Francis is preparing some kind of major revision to the rules governing the next papal election, Despite various denials of increasing intensity, those rumors continue to circulate. We'll unpack what to make of it all. Third up this week, we've got, at long last, the Vatican's trial of the century. After two and a half years, after 85 separate hearings, is finally set to conclude this week. We'll try to preview coming attractions in terms of what to look for and what it all might mean. Fourth. Hope for a homecoming? Argentina's new president was sworn in this past Sunday, and we'll try to, like, diagnose what the impact of all this might be for the long-awaited, much-delayed, often speculated about, but never happened, papal homecoming trip to his native country of Argentina. And then finally this week, a note about us, how a scandal that is unfolding in the Catholic media world tangentially involves crux, I'm going to share my thoughts on that. All that and more is waiting for you this week on Last Week in the Church. So please, for the love of God, in the name of all the angels and saints and everything that is holy, don't go anywhere. Stay where you are. I will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are, they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So, Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, December 12th in the year of our Lord, 2023. We begin this week with keeping on, keeping on. So as anybody who has been watching the show, or for that matter, has been paying attention, even in a vague way, to Catholic news knows, Pope Francis of late has been dealing with another health scare. He is coping with what the Vatican has described as a serious case of bronchitis that is an inflammation of the tubes that carry air to and from the lungs. 
which has made it difficult for him to talk at any great length in public and in general has kind of impeded his joie de vie. And because of this condition, he was forced to cancel a planned trip to Dubai for the COP28 summit. He has, well, I mean, the Vatican says he has curtailed his schedule, although quite honestly, looking at the calendar of appointments that Pope Francis has kept up since all this began, it doesn't seem to me particularly curtailed. But in any event, there are certain appointments that the Pope has either skipped or he's asked somebody else to read his prepared text in his name rather than doing it himself. Yet, like, look, here's the deal. For the Feast of the Immaculate Conception this past week, which is a traditional sort of cornerstone on the Vatican's annual calendar, the Pope not only maintained his traditional visit to the Piazza di Spagna, that is the Spanish square here in Rome, where there is a column with a statue of the Madonna at the top of it, where the Pope traditionally delivers a kind of Marian prayer. Not only did he do that, in his own voice, by the way, but prior to that, he went to Rome's fabled Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major, which, by the way, is pretty much where we film this video. It's just two minutes away from where we are right now. And, you know, prayed to the Virgin there too, again, you know, in person and in his own voice. The Pope, this past Sunday, delivered his traditional noontime Angelus address, and in his own voice, prayed, among other things, for peace in Ukraine and also peace in Gaza. So, bottom line is that while the Pope apparently has been hobbled by this latest incident, it doesn't appear that he has been put down on the mat. And on the contrary, he continues to show signs of, once again, a kind of remarkable capacity to take a hit and yet keep moving forward. Let me quote for you the movie Rocky, in which an aging Rocky says to his son, like, the test is not how hard you can hit. The test is how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And by that test, Pope Francis seems like a slugger. I would point out, by the way, that just not long ago, he actually met Sylvester Stallone, the guy who plays Rocky, who introduced himself and his brother and members of his family to the Pope. All right. So here's the thing. What it appears is that Pope Francis is trying as much as possible to marshal his strength ahead of the very demanding Christmas and New Year's holidays. Here's what we've got. On Christmas Eve, December 24th, the Pope is scheduled to preside over, I don't mean celebrate, because remember these days what the Pope does is he presides over a mass, but somebody else actually celebrates it for him. In any event, the Pope is scheduled to preside over what the Vatican still obstinately insists on describing as the Midnight Mass, despite the fact that it actually begins at 7.30 in the evening. But in any event, that's on his schedule. The next day, on Christmas, he is scheduled to give the Urbi et Orbi address, the address to the city and the world, which typically is a kind of 360-degree review of the Vatican's social, political, and diplomatic concerns big production. He's still scheduled to do that. On New Year's Eve, he's scheduled to preside over the traditional Vesper service. New Year's Day, he is scheduled to deliver the Angelus Address. On January 6th, he is scheduled to preside over the Mass for the Epiphany of Our Lord. And the next day, January 7th, he is scheduled to preside over a Mass for the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord and to baptize newborn children of Vatican employees during the, the previous year. So, look, if the Pope is able to do all of that, and at the moment the Vatican clearly believes that he will, then I think we can probably say that, you know, whatever his health problems may have been of late, they haven't really gotten in his way. On the other hand, if they are forced to cancel, curtail, truncate, whatever, you know, any number of those appointments, then maybe we can get a little bit more alarm. My point at the moment is the Pope that we saw on Sunday during his Angelus address seemed to be a Pope clearly getting better. You know, it, at this point, I think, look, 
you know, if, if this were, you know, a security challenge in the United States, I would say we can go down from like DEFCON 5 to maybe DEFCON 3 or something like that, because it does seem that the Pope is rallying. All right, second up this week, conning the conclave. So, some time ago when we've discussed it on this show, two conservative Catholic news sites in the United States, The Pillar and The Remnant, carried stories suggesting that the Pope was preparing changes to the rules governing the next conclave, that is, the election of the next Pope. And those rules had to do with who could participate in the general congregation meetings preceding a conclave, and also, at least according to the Remnant Report, who could actually cast votes in the conclave itself. The Remnant suggested that the Pope was contemplating including laity in that process. Now, those reports suggested that the Pope had entrusted this project to Italian Cardinal Gianfranco Gerlanda, a veteran canon lawyer. Gerlanda promptly issued a denial saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. I am not involved in any of this. Nevertheless, these rumors have continued to make the rounds because, look, this is the 21st century. You can launch a rumor with great ease. You can extinguish it only with enormous difficulty. And frankly, even so, maybe you can never actually put it to bed. So, this week, in fact, just a couple of days ago, the Italian paper of record, that is Corriere della Sera, kind of like the New York Times of Italy, carried a piece by veteran journalist Massimo Franco addressing these rumors in which he once again quoted Gerlanda saying, look, I have no idea what you were talking about. He said, I have not been asked to prepare any document. I've never met the Pope to discuss this. If this is going on, it's going on without any involvement by me whatsoever. Basically speaking, he's saying, this is a lie, okay? And then Franco went on to quote someone he described as a source close to Pope Francis. Actually, he said very close. I honestly don't know what that means. But in any event, this source described all this as a lie intended to attack the Pope. To be honest with you, I'm not quite clear. Like, I get that this may be a false rumor. Okay, because the Vatican beat is full of those all of the time. I'm not quite sure how this particular rumor would amount to an attack on the Pope, because the thing of it is, this is not accusing Francis of heresy, right? It's not saying he covered up sex abuse or that he's turning a blind eye to, you know, financial crime or something. It's saying he is contemplating including laity in the election of the next Pope, which, if you are an admirer, of Pope Francis and you're in favor of lay empowerment, like, wouldn't you actually like that idea? In other words, I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to damage the Pope politically, but in any event, I just want to make two points. Number one, let's assume that these rumors are true. And by the way, <laughs> Gerlanda's denial seemed pretty convincing to me, so I have no confidence whatsoever that this is actually the case. But let's even assume for the sake of argument that it is. Number one, including non-cardinals in the conclave. Folks, the whole institution of a cardinal dates from the sixth century, which means for five centuries, the pope was elected without cardinals being involved. And we also know that even well after that, even after in 1059, theoretically, the election of the pope was restricted to cardinals, there were, all, there were still papal elections in which non-cardinals participated, including the famous Conclave of Constance in 1417, in which there were 23 cardinals and 30 representatives of different nations, none of whom were cardinals. So what that means is that Pope, Martin V, was elected. Not only were, did non-cardinals participate, cardinals weren't even the majority. So look, if the truth is that Pope Francis is going to include non-cardinals, my point is it's not like this has never happened before. In terms of including laity, again, in the early centuries of the church, the Bishop of Rome was chosen by a consensus among the clergy and the laity. Even in later centuries, lay rulers, lay monarchs in Europe continued to exercise a veto right 
That veto right was applied as recently as 1903. So he's going to include non-cardinals. He's going to include laity. Maybe, maybe not. But if he does, let's not pretend that it's some kind of a revolution because the truth of it is we've been down this road before. Okay. Punto e basta, as we say in, here in Italy. Or to quote the movie The Untouchables, the lesson endeth here. All right. Third up this week, we've got at long last. So the Vatican's trial of the century, which we've discussed multiple times on this show, that is this trial for financial crime against 10 defendants, including Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, probably is going to come to a conclusion after two and a half years and after 85 separate hearings. It's probably going to come to a conclusion this week. The presiding justice has said that he wants a verdict by December 16th, which is next Saturday. It could even come before that because today, as we speak, is the final hearing of the trial where attorneys for the defense, the prosecution, and also the civil parties involved in the case are presenting their final closing, what the Italians call arringue, which basically means harangue, and I love that. So the final harangues of this trial are being delivered today. So a verdict theoretically could come as early as tomorrow, but in any event, sometime between tomorrow and Saturday. Look, here's the thing. At one level, these verdicts are about the defendants, right? Is Cardinal Angelo Becciu, the Pope's former chief of staff, going to be found guilty? Are the other nine defendants who involve two former officials of the Vatican's anti-money laundering watchdog, three former officials and consultants of the Vatican Secretary of State, two Italian financiers, and one of their lawyers, and a woman who describes herself as a freelance security consultant who was tapped by Bechu to try to help with the liberation of a missionary nun who was kidnapped by Islamic militants in Mali. Are all of these people going to be convicted, or are some of them at least, going to be convicted of financial crime? But more deeply, this trial shapes up as a referendum on two other fronts. One, the seriousness of Pope Francis's financial reform. This trial is supposed to be the ultimate proof that Pope Francis is serious about wanting to clean up Vatican finances, about ushering in a new era in which there will be accountability and transparency. Now, if the verdicts are perceived as just and right, then it might cement his legacy as a great reformer. If, on the other hand, the verdicts are perceived as an exercise in scapegoating and shifting blame, you know, then it will have the opposite effect. And on another level, this trial is also a referendum about the Pope's exercise of power. Not his spiritual power as the head of the Catholic Church, but his temporal power as the sovereign of the Vatican City State. Modern popes, including Francis, have said multiple times that one of the tests of a real democracy, of a legitimate state, is a separation of powers between the executive and the judiciary. And yet, in this trial, it has become clear that as far as the Vatican goes, there is no separation of powers. Pope Francis is both the supreme executive and the supreme judicial authority. He hires and fires the judges. And so a lot of people would say, how can this trial possibly be fair? And if the perception is that the verdicts handed down in this case are a result not of a neutral administration of justice, but an excessive concentration of power in the papacy, then it could handicap the Pope's moral authority as a teacher in terms of Catholic social theory. So, look, there is a lot on the line. We are expecting verdicts this week. As ever, we at Crux will be on top of it. We will have it covered like saran wrap. All right, fourth up this week, hope for a homecoming. So on Sunday, the new president of Argentina, Javier Millet, was sworn in and took office as the 10th president of a democratic Argentina after the period of the military junta ended in 1987. Millet famously is a 
oh, what would one say, a kind of chronic critic of Pope Francis. He has, on various occasions, described the Pope as an imbecile, as the incarnation of evil on earth, as a communist, and, excuse me, because I know this is a family show, but he's also called him a son of a bitch. Okay? Now, admittedly, during one of the debates during the presidential campaign, Malay apologized for at least some of those comments about Pope Francis. And admittedly, after his election, Millet issued a statement saying that Pope Francis had called him to congratulate him. The two men apparently had a polite conversation. And among other things, Pope Francis promised to send Millet a rosary that he had blessed. Now, that may sound cool until you understand that I, during the course of my life, have been in the presence of three different popes on God, I don't know, maybe a hundred occasions. And you know what happened every time? They handed me a rosary they had blessed because that's the standard parting gift you get for any encounter with a pope. So it's not exactly as if this was Pope Francis showering the new president of Argentina with his favor. But whatever, in any event, it's still a nice gesture, right? Now, the question all of this raises is, does the election of a self-described anarcho-capitalist who promised during his inaugural address to slash, basically eviscerate, programs of social support that are supported by Pope Francis and all of his clerical allies in Argentina, does that help or hurt the prospects that Pope Francis is finally going to make after now what is almost 11 years, right? That homecoming trip to Argentina. Look, here's the thing. I am going to open the betting line at 60-40 in favor that in 2024, Pope Francis is going to go to Argentina. I'm going to say 60-40 in favor. Let me first give the arguments against. The arguments against the, the Pope's health, obviously. You know, he may not be in shape to make this trip. Secondly, the fact that he may not want to give a photo op to Millet, who kind of incarnates every political position this Pope despises. Okay? Arguments in favor. Number one, this may be his last shot. If he doesn't do it now, he's probably never going to be able to do it again. Secondly, he's already put off two trips. In 2017, he said he was going, and then he pulled out. In 2020, he said he was going, and then he pulled out. If he were to pull out a third time, you know, I don't know, but I think a lot of people would wonder, well, why are we even paying attention to this? And third, look, you know, I think this is something the Pope wants to do before the end comes. And this really is the moment, if it is at all going to happen. So, look, here is the thing. There is a new regime in Argentina. It is clearly not the government of Pope Francis's choice. But, on the other hand, if there was one thing he surely has learned 11 years into his papacy, it is that his power over the Vatican City state may be absolute, but when it comes to the rest of the world, the Pope simply does not have a magic wand that he can wave and make things turn out the way he wants. If he's going to go to Argentina, probably it is now or never. All right, finally this week, a note about us. So if you pay attention to Catholic affairs, you may be aware that recently another Catholic media platform called Church Militant has been going through some difficulties because the voice and face of Church Militant, a well-known guy by the name of Michael Voris, recently was forced to resign over unspecified, what, acts of misconduct, forms of misconduct, personal misconduct. Now, look, we have not written about this at Crux, and I have no desire here to celebrate anybody's personal misfortune. It's just not how I roll, okay? And but let me also say that I have actually been on Church Militant's air a couple of times, interviewed by Michael Voris, and while he clearly has very strong conservative and traditionalist opinions, I found him a smart and engaging guy. So I take no pleasure whatsoever in anything that's going on. But I just want to say this. In the wake of all of this, 
a former employee of Church Militant went on a podcast this past week in which he described some of the internal dynamics in the organization. And along the way, and this was hardly the most important point he made, but he described a couple of times in which he felt the church militant had maybe unfairly engaged in personal attacks. He cited some coverage by church militant against Austin Ivory, you know, the biographer of Pope Francis, a well-known figure in Catholic affairs. But he also cited me. And he said that, you know, church militant had reported that John Allen of Crux had been shacked up with an employee of Crux and, you know, was perhaps not living a chaste lifestyle. And the guy, in all fairness, said that that was probably unfair and that they owed me an apology. Here's the only thing I want to say about all of this. Okay. First of all, I want to say thank you to this former employee of Church Militant, David Gordon, for acknowledging that they kind of went off half-cocked. You know, as I said at the time, had they asked me, had they asked my ex-wife, had they asked anyone involved in the situation, they could have gotten the facts straight. No one did that. And, you know, it was unfortunate. But here's the real point I want to make. Look, the truth of it is this, okay? My first relationship with my ex-wife failed. Now, it was annulled by the church, so there was an official finding that there was never a sacramental marriage. But nevertheless, it is true that relationship failed, and that is on me. That's on me as a husband, and that's on me as a man. And I have to own those failures. And so if you want to criticize me, you have every right to do so. But the true injured party in this situation was not, is not, and never was me. It's my wife, Elise, who was also named in this report by Church Militant, because if I was shacked up, I was shacked up with her, which means that she theoretically would have been involved in that situation as well. And I can tell you that whatever my failures may have been, she had no part in any of this. Never, not once, did she ever transgress Catholic moral teaching. And in fact, she is a tremendously serious Catholic who comes from a very serious Catholic family. And at every point in our relationship, fidelity to Catholic teaching about the nature of relationships and the nature of marriage was an absolutely indispensable element of anything that we were going to do. So look, David, thank you so much for the intellectual integrity it took to say out loud that this report may have been off, off point. But look, you don't owe anything to me. I'm a big boy, and I was a fair target in this situation. The person who was owed an apology by Church Militant and by everyone else who took this report seriously is my wife, Elise. And for whatever role I played in making her a target, I want to put my apology on record here this week. I don't want to belabor this point because the truth of it is, at the end of the day, Michael Voris took his best shot at us and here we are, right? I mean, you know, we're fine. But I just want to say that as the dust settles from this episode and as people unpack the lessons, the real lesson is not that me, prominent journalist, needs an apology. The real lesson is that the woman at the heart of this affair, and let's face it, as Catholics and as people, we sometimes discount the women who were in these stories. She's the one who was actually injured and who actually has a right to having her good name restored. And I would encourage everybody who has any role in all of this to do everything they can to make that happen. All right, enough. Basta, as we say in Italian. That is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories, except the last one, because we're not going to belabor this on the site. Okay, but in any event, you can find full coverage of everything else on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. Once again, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will be here again next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, 
Have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will talk to you again very soon.